Welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast, the podcast where we explore the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. Join us as we delve into topics such as consciousness, spirituality, and personal growth with expert guests and thought-provoking discussions. Get ready to expand your mind and discover new insights on this journey of self-discovery. Now here's your host, Peter Michael Deeds. I have the immense pleasure of welcoming a truly remarkable guest, Lisa McArdle. Lisa is not just an author, but an international best-selling author, an Ascension guide, an award-winning speaker, and a spiritual coach. She's also a channel for the Light Council, a group of benevolent beings who bring wisdom from higher realms into our world. For nearly three decades, Lisa has been on a mission to guide high-powered female executives, influencers, and people from all walks of life on their spiritual journeys. She's a master creator of manifestation and miracles, someone who traverses the multidimensional realms of consciousness, and most importantly, she leads women on a path to remember their power, worth, and sacred divinity. Lisa is passionate about supporting individuals in their spiritual growth, helping them reconnect with the source, awaken their full potential, and live the extraordinary lives they were created for. So fasten your spiritual seatbelts and prepare to be inspired as we delve into the wisdom and experiences of Lisa McArdle on this episode. Lisa, (laughs) welcome. I'm so thrilled to have you today. Thank you, Peter. That's quite an introduction. I'm like, wow, that was a lot. (laughs) Talk to me about your early years. Can you share with us some of your earliest memories or experiences that made you feel connected to something beyond the physical world? What initially sparked your interest in spirituality and metaphysical concepts? What a great question. I really, truly believe I've been on my spiritual path from my earliest memory. So I was raised in a very religious household. I was also a sighted one from birth, meaning that the ghosts in my house would wake me up in the middle of the night and have conversations with me. And I'd be in the outbuildings and I would hear people talking and it was terrifying in so many ways. And Because of the religious imprint that was also simultaneously happening, it was like, no, none of that is happening. That is not happening. That is not you. That's light. That's you heard. That must have been a car. That must all the reasons. So I became really aware that was simply not accepted. It wasn't nurtured and it was dismissed and denied. So I shut it all down. And that was probably around five years old. I was pretty early when it stopped happening. And then it came back in a flash when I was 26 and I become a massage therapist and all of a sudden I was doing massage one day at this super high end resort on the California coast, living my best 26 year old life. And I massaged this man. And all of a sudden I was seeing like watching a movie, this man's really inappropriate behavior and really overtaking energetically women. And it was long before the me too movement, but I was watching this man in power take power over women. And every time I touched him, I would get another image and I'd take my hands off. And I was so I'm in a room doing massage. His partner was there being massaged by another person. And I was terrified again, like a lot of terror. So I'll say that my path has been an entire lifelong path. I think I was 18. I saw a flyer on a wall about a past life regression workshop. And I drove myself an hour and a half to this little place and took a day long workshop on who does that at 18 so or 19 or something. So I can honestly say I've been on a spiritual journey my whole life and had to ride through a lot of density. I believe that many of us who are standing as light leaders in this time had very intense childhoods and had to navigate a lot early on so we could really embody the truth of the density ride of third dimensional living and bring the essence of our higher self and our true remembrance through simultaneously. Yeah, been a journey. In terms of discovering your gift, can you walk us through a moment when you realize you have the ability to channel and communicate with energies or entities from a higher realm? What was that experience like for you? That was fun. 
That was a fun one. A couple of years after my site came back, I was at the same place. I was a yoga teacher at the time. I'd get everyone into Shavasana, into the resting pose at the end. And all of a sudden I would be like bestowing these blessings. Like I would be saying these words and I was literally like, who is talking right now? <laughs> like, <laughs> so beautiful. These transmissions started coming through that were like way more expansive and words over. It's been many decades since then. Words are my jam. I love words. It was like a funnel of transmission was coming through me in in those spaces. And I was, I had gotten some help when my site started coming back on. I was working with a a psychic woman, an intuitive at that time. And I was like, so I need help. And she was like, okay. So she was teaching me how to work with my gifts. I was like, God, this beautiful stuff is coming through. And she's there showing me that there is just a funnel of light above you. And they're just simply pouring messages through. So at this point, I feel like me and we and they are this symbiosis of each other. So often I'll say, oh, they're saying, and it just comes through. Around that time, I started intentionally working with an energy named Kuan Yin. Many know who she is. She's the goddess of compassion. And she kept coming to me. And she actually worked with me to teach me how to allow her to move into my physical form. And it was like a two-year journey. Like it was a long journey of sliding over and feeling her essence come in and me pushing back and coming in. So I did become a full body channel. It was about, that was probably 18 or 20 years ago. And so it simply evolved since then. Um, And then the galactic beings came in about eight or 10 years ago. And so I was working with angels and guides and master energies. And I'd find them up here. And then the galactics started coming in over here, up into the right. It's interesting how, how we find the energies. It's part of my gift. And it's also part of my service. And I believe everyone has the capacity to do it. It's not a unique gift. We all are channels when we open up from our resistance and allow the divine. And it's important that we only allow the divine to come in because there's opportunistic energies that would like to come in as well. I've come to the knowing that it's a true thing, but for many people, the whole process, they might think it's mysterious and it's all about enlightenment. And there are those aspects to it. The question I want to ask you is, were there any initial challenges you faced when you began channeling and how did you overcome them? Can you share any particular breakthrough moments in your journey? I'd say the biggest obstacle or challenge was learning how to surrender. So it was trust and surrender, which I truly believe are the two components to the master recipe of all of this, of all the experiences, whatever we're doing. When Kuan Yin was coming in, she'd be like, you have to simply like you're peeling the peels off of an orange. You have to peel back so the energy can slide in. And I would get scared and I would resist until I could trust that it was safe. And I could feel the fullness of every time she would come in, I would weep because of the level of love that I felt in my body. I could cry right now. There is nothing as pure as when a divine being touches you with her essence, because all it is the epitome of, of love that is unconditional. The overcoming was of my resistance and my fear and my trust. And that again, I believe that is the recipe for all of us in our awakening, in our becoming, in our remembering is we have to be in bold, powerful and fearless and resist nothing and allow for everything, basically. You're moved, aren't you, and touched? Yeah, it was a beautiful gift to experience and Mm. continue this day because what we really want in 30 years of being a healer on this planet, I believe that the core essence of what every human needs to heal is a belief that they are worthy and to be touched by love that is unconditional. When we receive that, there's nothing else that matters. Really, I've certainly felt that. I don't have the words to give it descriptive value, that radiance, that fullness that love and it's not like spousal love or relationship love or sex it's so different to that it's god is creator it's infinity it's the universe it's the source of which we were created it's the true essence of who we are we've just forgotten and we've been so removed from it that it feels like it's this mystery of experience outside of self but it is really the true nucleus of of our existence we have to find our way back home yeah, that's right. Book. 
That's <laughs> your book. I haven't read through the whole thing. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, I mean, I've, I've got questions for you every chapter near enough, but you had this profound experience. I think it was called Turto Empul Temple, Temple in Bali. Yeah. And your experience there seemed to me marked a profound shift in your consciousness. And you describe it as a subtle yet significant moment of awakening. Can you share more about the environment and atmosphere at the temple that set the stage for this experience? And what made this moment so transformative for you? Yeah, I think anytime we strip away the familiar, this is why I love traveling and I love going to other cultures because you want to know who you are. You strip away the comfort and the familiar. You put yourself in a different language, in a different time zone, in different colors and flavors and money. Your true essence comes through when you have to find your way. So there's that imprint. And Bali is simply such a magical space to be. But the day that we entered this temple, I was overcome, I would say, with the beauty as I was often in Bali. It's such a beautiful and such a ceremonial existence that these people have. Everything is ceremony. Everything is ritual. And I believe our culture misses that a lot. So I was taken back by the beauty and I was taken back by the diligence of which people were moving. So there's about 15 spigot heads of like deities with water coming out of their mouth and everyone is dressed ceremonially, go in your ceremonial clothes and everything in Bali is about offering and receiving. And so you bow before these heads and you let their water wash over you. And you give them something that you're complete with. So it was like, I give you my fear. And you bow and you bathe and let them take it from you. So to be that intentional. And I think what was so unique about that space with the beauty and the silence and the presence and so many people doing this ritual. And you walk through each of them several times. It is a long, arduous journey. Often we're like, oh, I did the thing. Now I'm good. And you get back to it. But it was like this long. It took, it was at least an hour and then you do it again and then you do it again. So being in that presence and in that beauty and almost digging up what was wanting to be complete and offering it over as people had done for thousands of years, right? The ancientness of it. That was the piece of it. And I came out of it and I was very expanded and I had gone and looked at the source of the waters. I can't remember if it was before or after walking through, maybe it was after walking through the, the spigots. We walked up and we're walking through the temple and people were being married and babies being blessed. And we got to the point of origin of where this body of water that comes through the spigots was held. And it was one of the most beautiful things that I'd never seen water look like that. And it just didn't even feel like it came from this planet. And it probably didn't. The color of it and the essence of it, it was like looking into this crystalline space of magic. And then I knew that's what we had been blessed with. Again, the ancientness of it all and the remembrance of like lifetimes past. So I'm walking through the temple and this other woman who was the retreat leader, my really good friend, her name is Lisa too. And she taps me on the shoulder and she's, what are you feeling right now? And it brought me into this awareness of my presence. And I was so keenly aware that I was feeling nothing, but everything. Like people talk about the zero point. I was in the zero point. I was fully present. I was having all of my awareness, yet I had zero attachment. To, I was completely neutral. And it was like, I couldn't even feel, you always feel like the tug of your bra. It was like, everything was weightless. It's hard to give words and I'm the word queen, <laughs> but it was like everything was simultaneously weightless and real and present yet completely neutral. And I was so grateful she asked the question because it, it gave me the awareness of being in this space of everything and nothing. Feeling to be both everything and nothing, it's surrendering to the nothing that you are, but to the something that you are. And what did it reveal to you about the nature of identity and ego? Let's also remember that this was a good 10 years ago, I'd say. So I feel like my consciousness has evolved so much. So I'd like to say that that experience has impact probably in greater ways even now than it did then. But from my perspective, because all I have is this now moment, from my perspective of here to there, 
I would like to say it was a reminder of the great illusion Mm -hmm. of what we attach to between the ego and the id and these things that we believe everything is something and how much we attach to things outside of ourselves because we perceive or believe we'll be better for it, for the relationship or the house or the figures in the bank, all this outside stuff that we're so conditioned and programmed to believe creates safety or wholeness. None of it's real. And then in that fullness, none of that mattered. There was no fear and there was no longing for anything. It was like everything existed within that moment, but everything I perceived to have value and meaning in its existence, the great illusion was revealed. So if I hold that frequency and that remembrance when I'm in my 3D turmoil self that we do that dance, then I can get back to a space of remembering that energy is the only thing that actually matters. The rest is an illusion. In that connective remembrance, because that clearly led to a profound remembrance of the truest connectivity to all things and source itself. How is this realization, if you bring it forward now, how has it continued to impact your life and your work as an ascension guide and spiritual coach? In what ways has it influenced the messages you share with others? I'd say the biggest thing and the biggest tool, perhaps, amongst all the tools that we have is we have to find neutrality. Neutrality. So are you familiar with David Hawkins, the chart power? Map of Consciousness. Yeah. So I play with that a lot in my work and my own being. And and I love it because it gives tangible marks of vibration. Most are familiar with it. At the base, shame holds the vibration of 20 and there's nothing that can happen. And Mm. then like 700, it's where everything is possible. But in the middle is that space of neutral and it vibrates at 250. And my awareness and my sense and how it teaches through me is that if you're in that space of shame and anger and grief and uh, your teeth are locked in and you're like, when they apologize, then I'll feel better. And really what we want is love, which vibrates at 500 or above, right? The only way to get there is first, you have to climb the steps. So how it's informed is from being in that zero point, being in that space of neutrality and knowing what it feels like. So concepts are one thing. Having the vibrational awareness of what something feels like is our master key code. Because once you get the feeling, if I know what neutral feels like, so when I sit in neutral, that vibration is assimilated into being neutral. And only from neutral can we then begin to move into those higher realms. Only from neutral... When we're in the lower density, can we get to love? I I think it informs everything. And I think it's one of our greatest tools. And then we have accelerator tools to go with. So how do we get to neutral and that sort of thing? But neutrality, because from that space, you're the observer. You're not attached. Your emotions are in a space where they can move in either direction. You get to choose that. And you can find forgiveness and it's the key to everything. Neutral, find neutral. If you draw a triangle... And you put neutral at the apex of the triangle and you put positive and negative on the equilateral sides. If you're standing in neutral, you can see both sides. People get trapped in the positive and negative. So it's blame, avoidance. You did this to me. They get trapped in that duality. But when you ascend to neutral, you're able to see both sides of things. It's the God self place of observing can transformation occur. Exactly. I want to delve into your books. Chapter one is about presence and I understand it's the first pillar of your book. Can you share what the concept of presence means to you and why it's so essential on the spiritual journey? How does it relate to finding one's way home? Thank you. It's a great question. One of my favorites. It was delivered through me as step one, because until one is present, nothing else is as available. And a lot of the matrix of which we're moving in, a lot of the programs and a lot of the devices that are, I believe, intended to keep us out of our sovereignty and out of our greatest expansion, have this kind of program running where we're either in the future or we're in the past, or we're using the future or the past to inform the future. And as I describe it in the book, the future is anxiety and the past is depression. Many people speak to this, but it reminded me of driving in the car. I say to my clients a lot, if you're looking in the rear view mirror all the time like this, you're going to crash, right? And if you're looking to GPS with such anxiety of needing to know what is five miles ahead so you can prepare 
you're going to crash. And two in 10, as I told my son when he was driving, like two in 10, eyes straight ahead. Don't look at anything else. You can glance to get information and then you're back here because that point of view, that perspective of what's right in front of you is all that matters. And only from that space of being able to be in presence and then fierce presence, which is like the absolute of this moment, this breath, only from that space are you then available to really receive pillar two is connection. Are you available to receive the nuances, the whispers we talked about earlier? Only from the space of presence, are you able to create what you desire from your vibration? Are you able to catch the directives of where your higher self and source itself wants you to go? Only from presence, can you catch your thoughts before they run away with you and have you in the, the whole rabbit hole of creating something you no longer desire. Only from presence can you be available to walk the path that your soul said yes to. So I believe not only is it the first pillar, but I believe it's the continual loop that takes through all the pillars of ascension that we have to keep coming back to presence, keep coming back to this moment, keep coming back to this vibration. It's the only control because we all want some control somewhere. <laughs> the only control we actually have is where our awareness is in any given moment. So I'll come to tapping on my thymus where I'm like, okay, Lisa, right here, this breath right here. And that also walks us out of the mechanism of the mind. I do a lot with walking out of the mind, the and then walking down into the heart and then into the womb. Because as we spoke to earlier, the mind holds the programs of the third dimensionality. We're not going to think our way to grace, to the holy and the whole. We're not going to think our way. We're not going to make plans. We're going to emanate. We're going to be the eminence of the creation. Of it. We only find that in body. And we can only get there for present. And the moment we're not present is the key indicator that we're in the fuckery of the mind. And the moment we're present, we get to drop down into our feeling state. We get to be right here, right now. And then I'll do this exercise sometimes where I'll take people into presence. And then I'll be like, open your eyes. What do your eyes land on? And that's an indicator. That's a message from the universe. Wherever your eyes land, here's a beautiful picture of Mary with a little lamb. <laughs> and so that says the mother is always holding us and the softness of our inner working is always available for us. Everything has a message, but only in presence are we able to speak the codes of the symbols of the messages that are really working hard to get the messages to us. Building off presence, you emphasize the importance of surrender. Can you provide any insights into how surrendering is a powerful tool for enhancing one's spiritual growth and personal evolution? And how can individuals practice surrender in their daily lives? As the pillars were coming through, there was a dance between presence, surrender, trust, connection, and they all weave together. I think surrender and trust are really the same frequency. And my sense is that when we're not in the mind and we're not ruminating in the future or the past, anxiety or depression, that in itself is a state of surrender because it is the being in this present. You have to trust and surrender to the unfolding of what is coming next. And you have to surrender that which is behind you as information. This always happens. They always do this based on what's behind us. I believe presence and surrender and trust are the key codes to our awakening. And I believe it's one of our greatest opportunities to move into the embodiment of that. What surrender looks like to me and feels like to me is finding that neutral space of observing that it is as it is. I do a lot of work in the temple arts and this brings in alchemy. And the teachings of Isis, when we're in the acceptance from a neutral space of something being as it is, only from that place do we have the sovereignty, the wherewithal to begin to alchemize it into becoming something that is different. To me, surrender is a large acceptance without trying to control and manipulate an outcome. We only control and manipulate based on our imprints of survival and of fear. It's part of the program of the matrix. Spirit said to me at one point, not that long ago, that fear is not an actual naturally generating frequency within the human being. It's an assimilation. And I said, what about, we?" they say like the fight or flight, like when the tiger's coming, you're going to rah. And spirit said, do not confuse adrenaline to take action, to pivot one's experience with fear. They're different frequencies. So I thought that was interesting. So surrender to me 
is a consistent willingness to stay in the neutrality, to remember that you're the creator and you create by your thoughts, by your feelings, by your vibration, and to trust that as I'm surrendering, as I am being in my presence, as I'm allowing it to be as it is, that there's an alchemy that gets to occur within me, that I can then tune into what it is that I desire and feel that as a frequency. Now I'm actively creating. We're always creating. I don't know. If, does that land? It's a oh, lot. Ab absolutely. When I ask you the question about the past and the future and driving the car is that we have to understand that what is in the present is your body. This is always in the present. Yes. Right. It's not in the past. It's not in the future. It's here now. So we have to work with our breath, with our heart. We have to work with those things with our chakras, yes. because that is what is present. It's the mind, it's the trickster. I like the word acquiescence, but, but when you surrender or acquiesce, it is a tough gig. The thing about it is when you surrender, on the other side of it is freedom. Yes. Yes. It's that resistance to it, like you were saying. And we don't talk about the rough and tumble of working with our spiritual anatomy. It's a tough gig. It's not sprinkling pixie dust everywhere. It's not puppy dogs, rainbows, and bonbons. Everywhere. Exactly. How are you doing for time? I'm good. I could go another five, 10 minutes. Okay. I'm not going to get through all the chapters with you, but I, I wanted to talk about dismembering to be remembered. Can you explain the concept of dismembering and how it linked to the process of remembering? What can readers take away from this chapter? I love plays on words and remembering to me is about coming back into that state of connection, right? The members are all connected in a commonality. So remembering is bringing your higher essence, your soul wisdom, your greatest knowledge, your great remembrance into actualized form. I believe we have to dismember a lot of the illusions and a lot of the mind matrix we've been talking about. We have to extract release and let go of the things that keep us from that true membership, mm -hmm. that being it membered, remembered into our essence and into our divinity. So that stripping away process, that's part of the deconstruction. So the third pillar is deconstruction and the deconstruction phase and the dismembering is where you begin to unattach to your five and your 10 year plan, thinking that you're going to control it and like the great illusion of control, right? The dismembering often and what we're seeing too, is I believe this lifetime is talks about it in the book is the karmic cleanup. Like we're going to be completing karmic cycles. A lot of dismembering is also about releasing the attachment you have to your relationships, to your community. We're watching a lot of people do a big, massive cosmic cleanup in what they perceive to be their security. How many relationships are wobbly? How many people are pivoting their jobs, where they live, who they live with, how they live? It's the wild west of the great unknown. I know so many people that don't even know where they're supposed to be on the planet. And I go through that too. Like, where is home now? And I had 27 years of really knowing where I was and what I was doing and how I was going to do it. And all that went. And it's like, oh, so that's the dismemberment. It's di dismembering from the attachment to our plan. And spirit keeps saying to me, there's three points that are going to hold up in this new frequency. It's self to self, which I find at the womb space, self to higher self, which I find in the eighth chakra, our soul self, and then itself to source itself. Those three points of connection are what's going to bring us home to this new frequency, to this new space of being expanded, exalted beings of light in human form. So we have to dismember all of our attachment to the things outside that we perceive give us safety, give us wholeness. Not all of them, I'm not saying every relationship and every life and every has to go through a dramatic deconstruction like mine did, but many are and many will. And that dismembering is also a dislodging, a dismembering mm. from some of your core belief systems. What I believe, especially in terms of connecting to the outside lens and the outside world has transformed significantly in the last two years. And much to the alarm of some people around me who still hold some old belief systems. And that's fine. I believe the new intelligence that's coming in is about EQ. It's mm -hmm. about emotional intelligence. And I believe that the most proficient expansion of intelligence is how quickly can you unlearn dismember from what you believe to be true so that you can come into the true membership of what is and what is becoming. That's really interesting because of clients in coaching, I'm guiding them to unlearn. So this really ties in with what you're saying, because all that stuff, all that story 
that they have going on and all these five ways to do this, 10 ways to do that is not about the essence of that person and establishing what the hidden cry is in that person. Because that's what I want to get to. And we're whizzing through some of these things. So I may may ask you if you would like to come back at some point to talk more about your book. I, I read the missive, the transmission from the Light Council. That was amazing. Can you talk about who is the Light Council? Because you introduced in Chapter 3 the Light Council. Can you describe who the Light Council is and what role they play in the spiritual journey? I've opened myself up to be a channel, a transmission for higher wisdom. Originally, decades ago, came as a deliverance of words in transmission as a yoga teacher, as I had said to you earlier. So I had been opening up my channels, if you will. And again, to demystify, I believe everyone is a channel. It is about opening up the essence of allowing higher wisdom, higher consciousness to spill on through with some protection and some understanding of what you're doing. So you don't just let everything come through. The light council. So I'd been channeling and working with ascended masters for probably a decade when these galactic beings started coming in. I started becoming more aware of my star seed self. That's a big buzz buzzword out there, a star seed. I had been told in a reading my early 20s that I was Pleiadian and that I would know my star family by the mark of the star. And I was like, what? And as my awareness increased and my spirituality increased and consciousness increased, I started becoming highly aware that I did hold DNA frequency with Palladian. So the Palladian started coming in and they started communicating and they had this really high buzzy energy. It was like, and they would just talk really fast and do all these things. And it was like such a high energy. Like I always leave my transmissions better than I came in. That's part of the agreement. So I get all the essence of their vibration in my body. And so it's like, you know, it's very uh, high vibe. It leaves me better. So the Pleiadian started coming in and in time through meditation, the light council started showing themselves to me was literally like in meditation, I would see this round table like the CEO boardroom round table, but at each of the 13 seats would be a different frequency or eminent of light, a different vibration. And I started coming into my awareness. So the Palladians were first and then the Octarians started speaking and then the Lumerians and then the Syrian energy, but I don't hold all the DNA codes. So some of them simply come as an essence of light. Then they start introducing themselves. They start bringing me online to their frequency when the time is right. So it's a council, best I can describe it. And they share information with me. Many people are familiar with the Galactic Federation of Light. My Light Council, the ones that I work with do say that they're part of that. I believe there's many councils of light and I believe they all have origins within the same structure or foundation that we perceive and receive them in the ways that we are amplified to. It was at this point, I don't really consider us to be separate. I think that's a great illusion of third dimensionality and five yeah. living. Like they just flow in and out through me. And there's pieces of the book that were encapsulated from my experiences, my stories, and there's transmissions. But how I wrote the book was unique. Like I had taken a lot of like how to write your book things, write your book in a weekend and how to write your book. And everything was like, get a structure and then go in and do it. And that's not who I am. I'm an Aquarius. We don't do structure. We do (laughs) magic. So everyone was like, just start writing. So I would sit and whatever... I would ask to be shown and whatever transmission would come through, I would start writing that piece. So I ended up with when people make quilts and they make these squares, I had all my quilts, my squares, and then we had to create a symmetry of flow, how they all came together. So I would show up as I do humbly and ask for guidance. And then I'd get these awarenesses. And then as you're writing a book, the book starts writing you. There's a piece in here about the oak leaf falling. And it it reminded me of something we were talking about earlier. So as I was writing the book, I'd go out and do my walk or I go out in nature and then I'd have these transmissions that would come. And then I knew I need to go back and write about them. So that was part of how they were channeling Mm. through me. I'll call it a co-creation, a collaboration between myself and the Light Council. And they don't really see us as separate. How can readers differentiate between their own thoughts and the messages from the Light Council? Are there any practices or techniques that can help one to establish a deeper connection with this guidance? 
Yeah, one of the biggest tools and how they worked with me, especially a lot in the beginning and actually even to today, they're like, is to go get out and get yourself under the stars, like to go sit Mm. outside with the stars and go into meditation in that way. I think it's really important that we meditate with the sun and we allow it to touch our pineal gland and we let our eyes hit the gaze of the sun because there's a transmission of light that comes from that. And I think it's really important that we also get our essence out to the stars. We ask for the transmission to occur. Then you got to trust. You have to trust what you're hearing, what you're feeling, what you're resonating with, and how that you're in communion or in a channel, we'll say, is because you can feel it. It feels like information that's a bit more expansive than your everyday thoughts might be, especially in the beginning. It's, whoa, what is that? And there's a sense of knowing it is true. It is true. And often I experience, especially in the beginning, now we feel like we're meshed into this one thing, but... In the beginning, the words would come in a way that was more expansive than my normal vocabulary. And I have to say, when I started channeling, especially when I started channeling the Light Council, I was doing it with writing and it had to be pen to paper. It couldn't be typing. Mm. And it was about the flow and the words and I would get out of the way. And so free writing is a great way to access your channels, go into meditation, have the piece of paper. Now I pretty much speak them and then have them transcribed because it's just more efficient, but you have to trust it and open up and ask, use the parameters. I work with Archangel Michael a lot as the protector, because there's a lot of malevolent beings that would love to come into your being as well. So you have to be really Mm -hmm. discerning about who you're letting in. You wouldn't let just anybody walk into your house and this is your house. So get yourself to the earth, get into a meditative state, sit under the stars, invite them to come forth and then trust with, I only receive that, which is for my highest good. I only receive that, which is of the light. I will only receive benevolent beings into my field. And when someone starts accessing the codes or accessing the transmissions, if you feel an energy come towards you and you feel their presence, you always say, are you here for my highest good? And if they are not, it is universal law that they will have to leave. So if they stay after that question, there's a pretty good indicator that they are for good and it feels good. Then you simply allow, you ask questions and you allow the messages, if you will, to be received. And then you got to trust it because it might sound like your own voice. That's the thing with channeling. It's not when Jesus comes to visit, it's not like I get this, I am Jesus. It's like the words come from what is identifiable within me, but the feeling, the heat that comes up in my body, the emotion that comes when I'm standing in the presence of such mastery, it's undeniable. It's undeniable. You just simply know. And that becomes the stardust of your understanding. Yes. And then you continue to show Mm. up and you trust it and you continue to surrender and you continue to open more and the connection deepens and and the transmissions become more and more fluid. What would you like to do? Do you want to come back? Because there's a lot more I'd like to go into with you about the Palace of Light. And there's so much to unpack in terms of surrender and trust and spiritual bypassing, all the things we talked about. I think it'd be very valuable to have that kind of transmission if you're open to it. Absolutely. I would love it. What's been your experience today? I love the space that you create. And I love how you keep bringing all of these concepts back down into the practical and back down into a digestible manner. I feel like we've done some really good transmissions here today. I'm really honored. Where can people find you? So at my website, there's actually a tea time connection with me. It's my favorite thing to do. I love to meet other sacred soul community connect. So there's a link to a discovery call session in there. It's like a 15 minute, 20 minute drop in that we do over zoom. And then we simply talk about the ways that we can create in life Mm -hmm. and enhance each other's experiences. So that's a good directive. My website, it's lisamccardle.com. And there's links in there to my monthly membership, The Palace of Light, Finding Your Way Home is all about us walking each other home. And I believe the more we connect and commune, I don't believe any of us do this alone. We really need to find our tribe and rise together. So lisamccardle.com. And then I'm on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, all the places. Thanks. And do you have any passing messages? The most important thing is that we're not doing any of this alone. Because that 3D separation is the illusion of suffering alone. And from the higher realm, as we move into a higher dimensionality, remember that we're connected to all things. So I would no sooner cause harm to you 
than to myself because we have a high regard for the gift of this experience of life. We realize the power, the potency of this gift, being a sentient being that has senses and feel touch and it's a miracle. And so if we're really in the honing of that miracle and realize that we're all walking each other home to this highest remembrance and that we lock arms and we do it together. I think that people are suffering out there a lot, feeling very alone and confused and becoming something new and not understanding what it is and having to let go of so much. We're clearing up karma. We're completing lifetimes of karmic agreements because as a higher exalted being, we don't have to suffer to learn. We get to remember that we are this infinite creator connected to everything. Don't walk the path alone. Find the people around you that are of like soul, like minds and keep shining your light. That's what we're here to do. That's our purpose is to be our greatest light. And spirit says through me, however you choose to express that is of your free will, but our purpose is to remember and to be the greatest expression of our light on this planet, to help Gaia wake up, to deconstruct the overlords that are playing the illusions through us and to bring the palace of light alive within us. You do not have to figure any of this out. You simply stand in the grace of your being and the wisdom that is innate within the expansion of your soul shall be made so clear to you that there will be no doubt as to what it is that the next step is for you. So pause until you trust the outcome, lock arms with those who are of like frequency and await your deliverance because it is eminent. What are you most proud of? Ooh, wow, that's a really good question. Oh, it's, it's a multifaceted one. I'm most proud that I have been put on this path of service for the entirety of my life. I'm most proud that I am resilient and brave enough to stand up and say and speak what needs to be from spirit's directive. I'm really proud of myself for making the very brave decision to be a warrior of light. Because as we deconstruct density, it isn't always easy. We've had to let go of a lot to get there. And I'm really proud that I'm willing to stand in the light and be a conduit to that light, no matter what. The real potency that came forth from that. Thank you so much for sharing. And it's been a real honor and a privilege to have this time with you. And I feel there's a mutual co-shaping that happens in this between you and me and whatever attends. Lisa, thank you so much. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you on the show and I can't wait for you to come back and do a part two. That's it for today's episode of Transcendent Minds. We hope you enjoyed this exploration of the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And if you feel inclined, please leave a rating and a review as this goes a long way and follow us on social media to stay up to date with the latest episodes. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time, keep transcending your mind.